Hello there and welcome to What's the Point? A question we should all be asking ourselves and the podcast by brand architect Bill Ellis that will help you discover, clarify and live your purpose. Hi everybody, it's your host Bill Ellis. Welcome to another episode of What's the Point? My guest today is a, is a man who through his career has evolved and grown and shifted and been successful all the way through. Um, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But first, let me just introduce Jeff West. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Bill. Thank you for uh, thank you for your time, and thank you for what I know is going to be uh, an entertaining and insightful uh, episode for me and and all of our listeners. So to get back a little bit to to Jeff, Jeff, um, we'll get into this. He 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 started uh, uh, as a young boy in Georgia living in uh, what a lot of people call a mobile home, what they called a trailer house. Uh, and no one expected him to ultimately become a multi-million dollar sales professional. And he did. And he continues in that, in that niche. But over and above that, he has also shifted and evolved and, and become very successful as an author writing two award-winning books and he's in the middle of not one, but two more that he's writing. So there's a lot to get to with Jeff here, and, and I look very much forward to that. Um, let me start with, uh, Jeff, the, the writing and the authorship. Um, how did it come about that you were, uh, I'll, I'll give a very quick setup, you were highly successful in the insurance business, in particular with Aflac and... <laughs> Um, and, and suddenly something happened and you, you said, it's time for me to write a book. And it's an exceptional story. Tell us about that, please. Sure. Uh, first off, thank you so much for having me on your show, Bill. It's an honor. I've, I've listened to some of your shows and, and uh, what you do here is high quality and your audience has just got to love that. So I'm honored to be on your show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, the, how it started for me is I had been in uh, sales and sales leadership for over 30 years. And I, it, the last 20 of that was with Aflac, the insurance company, like you said, and in field sales management with Aflac, we weren't employees. We were all independent contractors. So there was an entrepreneurial mm. flair, which hugely attracted okay. me to it in the first place. But I had been doing that for a number of years. The last 10 years, I was actually a state sales coordinator in the t uh, Houston, Texas area. Uh, and in most states with Aflac, the term state sales coordinator makes perfect sense because there's one per state. But in Texas, we're kind of big and we were doing as much volume by this point. This was 2004. We were doing as much volume in Texas as Aflac did the year I started in 93 nationwide. Mm -hmm. And so uh, but I'd been doing that for a while and I would always send out uh, coaching emails to my management team. And they would be things where I would I would tell a story, then work in a sales lesson in it or a leadership lesson into it. So it really started with that. And I had a, a, a matter of fact, when my mentor, the Aflac, retired, I gave him a binder with all of them there, there because he loved reading them. But I, I, I had decided that I wanted to write and the sales parable is my favorite form. And so okay. I. Uh, began to write that book in late 2003, knowing that I was going to leave and retire at the end of 2003. And our mutual friend and just a, one of the greatest guys in the world, Bob Berg, had become mm -hmm. a friend to me over this time. And I, said, I sent him an email and said, I know you've got to be super swamped, but w I'd love to have you read this. I want to know if it's good because I needed confirmation. I, I thought it was good, but I needed someone outside of my yeah. head to tell me they liked it. And I sent it to him and he said some very complimentary things. And he, he volunteered to help me make certain connections happen. And, and so that's where that started. Uh, and then over the years, I've done a lot of speaking I went by when I retired from Aflac January 1st 2004 I, I went out full-time speaking and selling a lot of books in the back of the room and that kind of thing and had a successful uh, year two years on that decided I didn't really want to travel quite that much so it, then it became more about doing workshops and and writing more but I'll tell you the latest book uh, the first book was called the unexpected tour guide it can your, your your followers your audience can find that on amazon and on audible yeah i, I want to dive into that a little bit just so i'm, I'm just okay. bookmarking that so your latest okay. book you're saying okay uh and if anybody gets the audible version of the unexpected tour guide it's me actually narrating it but there's also a little 
commercial in there. I'm giving away a course for people who buy the audible version of that book. I'm giving away a course mm-hmm. I've been selling for, oh, well, oh, nine years now for $97. And I'm just giving it to them for free. There's a little commercial in there. But the the, <laughs> the latest book with the, Lisa Wilbur, which I know you've had her as one of your guests, I, that's, I, I think that's even better than the first one. But the, they both have won awards. The, the first one won uh, an Axiom uh, business book awards, the, the bronze award. The second one won silver with the one I did with Lisa Wilbur. So now if I get a gold, I'll have the trifecta. Home. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So uh, let, let's just take a few a few minutes here to, to talk about the books uh, individually and, and then collectively about your ongoing writing uh, uh, effort and career. Um, it's not a hobby at this point. It's a career. Correct. Um, the Unexpected Tour Guide is, to me, a brilliant premise for a parable. Thank you. Because the hero in the story receives guidance literally from a completely unexpected, out of left field source. And, un- and, and, and from there, the story starts. And from there, the story gets really good. Share what you will, uh, whatever you want to tell. And by the way, if you want to give a little bit of a commercial, give a big commercial. Because I am happy for people to find out about the book, about the Audible book, about the uh, the um, offer for your course. All of it will be in the show notes. But, you know, hey, you're here because you have such good content and you're going to help people. So the more we can get people to, to be touched by that, the better. So talk to, talk to us. Explain the Unexpected Tour Guide. Well, the Unexpected Tour Guide is a story. I used the character name of Jim Ferris because he was one of my life's heroes. And uh, he was actually a stepfather of mine. And, but uh, it's a story of a young salesperson who's a good guy. He, he's been a leader in what he's done in the past, good work ethic. And he gets a job in sales, but it's just not working for him. And uh, so he's, he's getting a little bit of coaching from his sales manager, uh, another name I used in a real life person, who's a real life example for me, and that's why I got his permission to write his character into the book, and then he also gave me permission to use his name, but Jack Amberson. And okay. uh, the the story develops where this young man, it's set in Houston, he meets a homeless man, and the relationship between the two of them totally changes the direction in his life. And it, it, through some things that I won't tell too much to the reader, I mean, to the, to the audience that love to get the book, but through some things that uh, someone told me one time, this, this is kind of like uh, a Christmas Carol meets same kind of different as me. Is the two great books? And, uh, what, a, what a great description! It was a good analogy, I thought. <laughs> but uh, it, it's the story develops. You you fall in love with the characters. Uh, I got a couple of twists and turns in there where people won't necessarily know how it's going. To, what's going to happen next? Which is what I like to do when I'm writing. Uh, but the 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 book did well. I, I sold a lot of events and all that. But yeah, it's I'm very proud of it. It, it was. Uh, to have my first book come across as successfully as that one did made me very happy for sure. But I think it, it, it takes when, when someone is reading the book and going through the story, it literally takes someone who, who could start you from A to Z in the whole process of sales that's pretty applicable in all industries. I've got this one set in the insurance industry because that's my background. But mm-hmm. it, would, it transmits or transfers to all industries and it really takes a good solid sales approach and, and I've, I've been handed that book out quite frankly when I see somebody who's doing sales and I know them I'll just give them a copy of it because it's that strong and I know that if they'll follow the lessons they'll do well. Well see to me uh, uh, that's the magic of a business parable and we 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 have met because of a, a different business parable and you mentioned our mutual friend bob berg and the go-giver that he wrote with john david mann and and that whole series uh, but what the business parable does and what the unexpected uh tour guide does is it engages you in an entertaining story and gets you from point a to point b all the way down to point uh, xyz right. uh, in an entertaining way but like you said, it delivers solid, actionable uh, information, quality information that to me 
is not just focused in the insurance business or in business in general, but in life. There's life lessons in there, and that that is probably why you won uh, the, the award that you did, well, uh, because of all that combined. You're very kind. I appreciate now, your words. Uh, I want to say in, in your uh, writing niche for now, um, but you said you wrote that in 2003, 2004, mm -hmm. right? Correct. And your next book, your second book, I think you may have begun around 2019, give or take. My, the point is, there was a long gap between publishing The Unexpected Tour Guide and then partnering with uh, our dear friend and, and terrific woman, earlier guest on What's the Point? Look her up, uh, Lisa Wilbur. Uh, how did that come about? I mean, both both the length of time between the first book and the second, and then how did the, uh, I'll call it the partnership, the co-authoring with Lisa come about? Okay. the After the first book, I actually have written other books. I just haven't published them uh, and pushed them big in a book launch or anything like that. They were more how-to books. And during that time where I was writing more how-to material and doing workshops and keynotes and all that, I discovered that I don't enjoy writing just a how-to book. It's because mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, my branding that I use for workshops and, and keynotes is called Fusion Points, Engage the Science mm -hmm. of Persistence. And it's, basically it's built on the idea that all decisions are a combination of logic and emotion. And if you want someone to move forward with anything, it's got to be a combination of positive emotions with logic. If it's negative emotions, they're going to go away. But if it's positive emotions com uh, combined with logic, their decision is naturally going to be wanting to take that next step. And that's what a good parable does. It touches mm -hmm. the reader's emotions. If it's a good, well-written parable, you start rooting for the main character. You start falling in love with what's going on, and the storyline pulls you. And so when you combine that with the logic of what you're teaching, it, it's it's gold, and people will retain it more and they'll often put it into place more than they'll do on just a traditional how-to book. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, during the, the years in between the two, I actually did write some other things. I did a lot of blogging, a lot of workshops, that kind of thing, but it wasn't, I wasn't pushing myself to be a book author. And okay. uh, then when uh, Bob Berg started that Go-Giver Success Alliance uh, program that, it, that we're both members of, we, uh, it, uh, I met Lisa in that. I don't remember how many calls we'd had before Lisa jumped in, and this would have been somewhere around 2019, 2020. Mm -hmm. I think I started pre-COVID, but I think I met Lisa during that. But long story short, we were on this call. There's, you know, 30 or 40 people on this Zoom call with Bob, and Lisa uh, was feeling a little bit self-conscious. Uh, about being a, an Avon lady, even though she's super huge. She's like the fifth highest earner in Avon history. She has mm -hmm. over 5,000 people on her sales team. And uh, she, she had blue hair that day, and she was a little bit self-conscious <laughs> about it. And uh, she decided to, to kind of put it out as a joke. And so she said, yeah, if I want, and I'll, I'll try to do this with my best Lisa's accent. If you, if you ever want to stop being judgmental in your life, dye your hair blue. This is working for me. <laughs> she, said, she said she could be in a grocery store and she'd see a, a girl with a skirt that she thought, eh, that girl's skirt's a little too tight said the lady with the blue hair. So she, she's telling this on the call and I'm just laughing. And in the chat, I said, Lisa said the lady with the blue hair would make a great book title. If you ever do a book someday, okay. you should do that. And it was kind of a passing comment. And we just got to know each other over, I guess, that year. And then when I began to change my business model away from pushing so hard to, to do speaking events or workshops to just writing because that is literally my happy place. My grandchildren, mm -hmm. my children, my family, that's the number one happy place. But uh, writing, if I can, I can be in a room writing, it just makes me happy. And so I, I changed my business model. And it wasn't just going to be writing books for me anymore, but I wanted to reach out with people who are two people who had a message, who had an audience, who had... Uh, I felt like would have, be able to hold up their end of the bargain, Lisa, the way Lisa and I set this up, that I, want, I said, let's take some of your lessons that you're, you teach people, let's narrow it down to, a, I, you know, I said, let's narrow it down to seven, and then I'll write the parable and we'll teach those lessons. And she immediately agreed and we began a collaboration. 
and uh, you know I would work with her. Uh, we would you know probably zoom uh, a couple of times a month, and I wanted because I wanted to know her. And then I began to, to spin the tail, and that's another. It's a great story. I, the, the, my favorite thing about the unexpected tour guide and said the lady with the blue hair is the people that read it and tell me that they. That, so I'm not even in sales, and I love this book. That yeah. makes my day. And so, yeah. uh, the the said the lady with the blue hair is a story of a of a young woman who becomes a single mom, and she's trying to figure out how to raise her 11 year old daughter and move forward and she needs to build a career and she meets this unusual mentor on the beach in florida and it's the lady with the blue hair and the story that develops between the two it, it's a good relationship story it's got side stories uh it's got a little bit of romance in it it's it's, it's got all kinds of things but we take we basically take a snapshot of that woman's life for a year year and a half so and it uh, it's a, it's, I'm, a, I'm as proud or even more proud of that one probably than I am the unexpected tour guy because it's that good of a story. Uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to, well, it is silver and, you know, the unexpected tour guide only got bronze. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but I do want to interject because I, I want to make a very strong point to the listeners that if you have not become aware of Lisa Wilbur, if you have not listened to the episode that she has on What's the Point, it, it's it's somewhere in the 20s or 30s. I don't have it exactly, but look it up. Her story, uh, regardless of the book, the book reflects a lot about Lisa's journey. But Lisa's story is one that is inspirational, motivational, and educational, whether you're in sales or not, whether you're a female or not, whether you've uh, suddenly been, where am I going to get income from or not? Uh, and, and she's highly entertaining and highly successful, both in business and in life. So, so look that up. And, and I will strongly encourage everyone to uh, look for Said the Lady with the Blue Hair, because I, I thank you. I was, I was uh, honored to be a, someone asked to read it prior to publication, and, and I loved it. Um, if people right now were to really want to dig deeper, um, uh, Jeff, into learning about the book, buy the book, first and foremost, buy the book in whatever format it is. But if people want to learn more about that and more about you and Lisa and, and the whole dynamic, where would you direct them? Well, there's there's two places. You can go to my website, which is jeffcwest.com, and it's got pretty much everything that I've done. And I've got said the lady with the blue hair is actually on the front page one of the, because it's the newest release. Uh, but Lisa also put together a website that said the lady with the blue hair.com. And uh, the neat thing about her website, uh, number one, it's got a, a copy of all the endorsements, like the one you were kind enough to give. Mm -hmm. And, but it also has every podcast show, everything that she and I have both been on or separately. She's got it there. So you can find out more there just about how the process happened and it's an incredible, uh, incredible, incredible thing that she's done in that way. And this was not her comfort zone. So one of the, the behind the scenes yeah. stories on the book is Lisa stepped up in ways that, I mean, I, I've, I've always had a, a, the, the amount of time that I've known her. I've had a lot of respect for her, but she stepped out of her comfort zone for this. And when we were doing the audio book, especially, she had no acting background, none of that. And uh, she was able to rise to the occasion and the, the audible version of said the lady with the blue hair. I do the, the male voices and some of the narration. She does the female voices and some of the narration. And it comes off quite well, actually. We're pretty pleased with that as well. Excellent. OK, so I, I've not listened to the audio version, obviously, but I do want to say that I very much appreciate that you did uh, a lot of said the lady with the blue hair and all of the narration of the unexpected tour guide, because to me, I've listened to books that the author has done the narration and I've listened to books where they've um, had someone else, some voice talent do it. And you can tell the difference. Uh, so having the author do it, it, it's no one can tell our story as well as we can tell our story. And you have such a good voice anyway. Um, well, thank you. One quick, one quick sidebar. How did you get from Georgia to Texas? Uh, I actually, uh, the the first time I came to Texas was when I was in graduate school. My undergraduate degree, my original plan, uh, I have degrees in music. I was going to be a band director. I have a bachelor's in music education, 
And then okay. I came to Texas uh, in the early 80s to do a graduate degree in music composition. And the, so that's how I ended up in the Texas for that, just that one year. Went back to Alabama after that because my wife needed to finish up her degree. And I got, that's when I ended up getting into sales by accident, practically, because there weren't any teaching jobs open. And then the first year I made 50% more in sales than I was going to make as a teacher with a master's degree. And so I just stated the career. And then I did the musical instrument industry for, I think it was five years. I uh, got promoted the second year. They, they moved me back to Georgia to be the general manager for a location there. It was really weird. I was 23 or 24 years old, and I had 50 and 60 year olds working for me. It was it was an unusual <laughs> uh, stepping stone and, and awkward for me. But uh, but then I ended up in the industrial uniform industry with a company in Georgia. Uh, and after three years, I was their top salesman in the nation. And so I got promoted and basically recruited to a sister group with the same outfit. And they, they brought me to Texas. And uh, two years after that, I was I was their first general manager out here. And two years after that, we got bought out by a competitor. And that did not work my way very well. And it's mostly my fault because I should have had a better <laughs> attitude about it all. <laughs> but and then, and So I, I stayed with that company for about 18 months. And then that's when I started with Aflac after that okay well that's a great uh that's a great story of not only how you got from georgia through various stops and in, into texas now but also how you got from uh your what you thought was going to be your career path of music and band director uh into sales so thank you for sharing that but now that is a perfect segue into let's talk about you as a sales professional now. I mean, that was the first part of your professional career. Right. We've talked a little bit about your current effort uh, in writing. So you're a sales professional. Uh, you spent a lot of years towards the end of that active selling uh, with Affleck. Um, but now you do... Um, you do keynote speaking, you do coaching, you do leadership coaching. Uh, and you mentioned earlier your uh, your term fusion points, which I want to right. talk about because you talk about the science of persistence. I can't right. wait to hear how you describe the science of persistence. Well, it, it's interesting. And, and I'll tell you how I started this study, Bill. When I finished my career with Aflac and I was trying to, to develop my speaking brand, I, there was a question that puzzled me, and it's puzzled sales managers and sales leaders for decades in all industries, and it was this. How can you take two people who on their resume, they both look good. They, they, I always say they look good, they smell good, they, everything about them looks right, leadership skills, and you put them out in the field of sales, and one makes it and one doesn't. And that was confusing because you would, you would think that it would have been the same. And as I began to research that, I... I found out something very interesting. There's a science, an actual neurological process that goes on in our brains with every decision that we make. There's no, no exception to that. And when we learn what that is going on in the brain and we learn to work within that process, we can actually influence how some very key decisions get made. Uh, we can influence how a prospect that we don't know decides to listen to that first offering or rather than tell us, okay, you, no, thanks. You're going down the road. We can influence how that prospect in the sales conversation itself decides, okay, yeah, that, I, I think this is a good thing. We can move this forward like that. We can control how our sales team, our sales people make the decision to persist in their career and to stay with you rather than defect and go to a competitor. And we can even we can even influence our own personal decision about how we're going to stay after it and how we're going to to move forward. And it all comes down to the fact that there was a study done and I don't want to get too sciencey with everybody. But there's a study that I read. It was done by Dr. Antonio Damasio, who was a, a professor of neuroscience at USC and an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute. And he studied people who their brain function the, the parts where the, the, of the brain where the decisions, where the logical part of the brain is versus the emotional part of the brain, there are two different areas. And he studied people that that pathway had been interrupted and they couldn't, uh, the brain couldn't communicate the logic and the emotion to each other. And what he found with that study was kind of surprising when I read it. He, basically, these people could not make decisions. They could, uh, they could lay out the logical consequences they could do a, a number of things, 
But what he determined was the fact that the two parts of the brain aren't communicating kept them from making decisions. Mm -hmm. And so when you follow that through, basically what happens in each of us, every, every emotion that we have, the logical part of our equation, that's where companies will spend the money. Uh, the companies spend millions of dollars in a logical sales training program that's really good and it should work for anybody, but yet they'll still have issues with salespeople not being successful. And this is why it's the emotional part of the equations not being handled. Because basically when you get down to it, the emotional context, every emotion that we feel, what happens is it creates a an actual, it happens in the brain, but it creates a physiological response in our body. Uh, it, it, it creates a change in our feeling. Uh, the psychologists call that a somatic marker. So an emotion happens in the brain, it creates a, a feeling in, in our body. And from that point forward, when our body experiences that kind of situation, it rekindles that old emotion. Now, if it's a positive emotion, it creates good feelings. We want to keep doing that. So the, that's just how we respond as people. When it's a negative emotion, we want to get away from it. And so what happens is that feeling inside us, when we're, when we're thinking about that in a business context, and it doesn't matter if it's in sales or if it's in any other part of business, keeping your employees doing anything, what it amounts to is they're going to make the decision on what they do next based on the logic of what's going on and the emotion of what's going on. So if we can intentionally stack positive emotional experiences tied to the logic of what we're trying to accomplish, they'll stay with you forever. I, I had people, that, that's, that's the way that I built my sales team when I was a state manager with AFLAC and the regional and the district even before that. But it was by creating those kind of environments. I've been gone nine years now and the gentleman who has that particular position in Houston now, he says, you've been gone almost 10 years, your people still love you. And they'd fight <laughs> fires. They, they would, they, I, yeah. I made them feel appreciated. I made, I made so many positive things happen in the environment. And then I taught them a logical way how we could get the job done. Were we always successful? No, but we were always moving forward. And, and you retain people better yeah. that way. Because you, as a sales leader, you can't, you can't make a 10% increase every year if you're losing 90% of your sales team. It just won't work. And so that's what, that's what <laughs> we did. So you you did get a little sciency on there, which I think is brilliant, and and thank you for that because I think it's good for all of us to have that insight. But I I want to clarify something because I think it's very very important, kind of in the, and I don't want it to have gotten lost in the midst of uh, your explanation of the scientific approach of the science of persistence. What you talked about, and I'm going to paraphrase, was how to influence people so that they determine if it's right for them. Exactly. There's a exactly. big you're, difference you're between influencing, the influencing people. Yeah, there's a big difference between influencing people and manipulating. And that's right. genuine Absolutely. sales is influencing. Uh, and there's a big difference between uh, pushing things because it's important for the salesperson because they have a goal to make or a quota or they need a check versus presenting, as Bob Berg always says, presenting the opportunity for a sale to be made. And right. that's and that's what you talked about. And, and I love that. And, and it, it's very insightful. And, and I appreciate knowing that there's literally science behind that. Um, it's why we were talking about it's... Go ahead. Oh, it's how it's why we respond. And it's like you said, and thank you for helping make that clarification. And we're not talking about influence in a bad way at all. We're talking about creating an environment where it's mutually beneficial win win situations for everyone. If if we have something that's going to provide value to the people consuming that and we have a way of putting that together, that's one thing. And that's great. But when we combine that with a process that's designed to create a positive emotional experience with the logic of what we're doing, it makes everybody relax enough to move forward and they can focus on what a real value proposition is, which is basically it's their value from our proposition. If we're focused on helping them get that, everything works. Yeah, brilliant. So I was going to say you talk about influence and, and there's three points that you make about influence and I'm going to I'm going to kind of top line them and then throw the ball to you. Uh, the first step is how to get the companies in your market to decide to have the first meeting. Right. Um, how to influence, not manipulate, how to influence those decision makers uh, to decide to become your clients. 
And the third thing you talk about is how the sales team decides to persist in your organization. So you you kind of quantify those three under influence and you've touched base on them, but uh, help me understand that the, they seem to go together very nicely and they seem to be very interdependent. Well, in the three sections, you know, with the, let's talk about the prospects in your marketplace. For most salespeople, their initial contact with a company or a p prospect is going to be some form of asking for time to talk with them, asking them for that appointment, asking them for, it, it varies based on the industry. When I was in the insurance industry, we were asking for a face-to-face -face meeting. And uh, that's all well and good. We were a great company. We did our job well, and, and I was successful doing that. But when you add into your prospecting process uh, some steps before you even ask for that first appointment, you find that you get more people saying yes. For example, uh, one of the things, uh, I, I have an online sales course called Survival Skills for Commission Salespeople mm -hmm. in Insurance. And it's it's... I give away a free video series before that. And this is some of the things I teach in that series so that the salespeople, my goal with that class, by the way, in this free series was help them make enough money that they can earn the commissions to buy the course before they even have to do that. But the, uh, with the prospecting process, I call it priming the pump. And I teach a method that says that basically you determine three ways that you can positively impact, make a positive impression on the person you want your first meeting with. It might be that you do your research about the company and you find out, hey, this company has just received an award for something. And so you, you print it off and you send it to the person you want to visit with. I just saw this great job. I hope to meet you someday. Please expect my call. And but just something like that, because it's something they did and you're noticing it. People like to be noticed about what they do. Uh, with the Aflac, I used to always say we had the, those uh, ducks that you could squeeze them and they'd go Aflac. Well, I would, yeah. I would always tell people when I, when I would be sending something that I'm going to be getting in touch with you, and I'll bring you one of those cute little laugh like ducks like you see on TV. Silly things like that, but, it all, but what it did, it caused a positive emotional connection with that person. They were more willing to give me that appointment. I had one of my best uh, district sales coordinators of open accounts. She, she taught with her team. She taught them to do it 10 times. I think 10 can be overkill. But she, uh, but they would go by and do things like take a piece of candy by there and, and just all kinds of silly stuff. But what would, with each contact, and I teach a system of three, and then you're asking for your meeting. Uh, put a little note on there and said, hey, I look forward to meeting you. Please expect my call. And the reason I would do that is then when we call back and we have a, a receptionist there who's, uh, I don't call them gatekeepers. I call them key holders because they hold the key to the kingdom if you get mm -hmm. on their side. And... And it would be very easy to say, you know, hey, I've been here. To, I wanted to see if Bill had just a second for me to meet him. He should be expecting my call. Or if I'm calling him ahead of time, he should be expecting my call. Because I've told him three times, expect my call. And it also mm -hmm. makes that process happen faster. But then when you get on the phone and someone's received three things from you that kind of meant something, it showed you were paying attention, that positive emotional response connects with the logic. In our case, we did employee benefits. It connects with that, and it makes them naturally seem to be willing to take that next step. They still won't all do business with us, and that's okay, but it, it gives them the comfort to do that. And then when you're in the sales conversation with that prospect, just the simple, uh, quite frankly, just the simple fact of asking the right questions and being focused on helping them with the things that they need and not looking to make a sale, not looking to, to do that. What you're, what you're looking to do is you're looking to ask the right questions. They will tell you what they need to hear. And it's so funny because I always say that because the a lot of salespeople go in with this attitude of, of I've got to tell them everything I know about our company. Uh, you, you need to be very good at your job. You need to know exactly what you're doing, but you need to come in there and ask questions because you want to know what that person's going through. And you, you'll right. have a certain amount of idea anyway, because you know your industry, but you want to ask the right questions. And uh, if you say anything to them as a salesperson, it's a little bit suspect because, oddly enough, salespeople aren't always trusted. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> really? It, it's, 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 it's hard to believe. <laughs> but if I ask the right questions, they'll tell me things. I, I can tell them that, that, that they need a great employee benefit package in order to attract and retain mm -hmm. that worker. But if I ask them, you know, Tell me a little bit about how, why you designed your benefit package the way you are. What's your goal with that? And they say, well, we want to hire and attract good employees. It's way better if they say it than if I say it. 
And so it was a combination of that. You're focused on them. You're trying to help them get the maximum value for what you do. That alone, again, brings positive emotional experiences because they don't, they don't look at you the way they look, at, they look at other salespeople because you really do have their interest in heart. Mm -hmm. And then when you make that logical connection about, well, this is what we can do, it makes perfect sense to them. I, I would always teach the new salespeople uh, with Aflac, our job is brilliant. We have customers out there. We have clients out there, prospects out there who have a legitimate need for what we do. We've got a company that's considered the best in the industry at what they do. We make that connection. We have them holding hands and they get, they, it works and we get paid for being the one to put the relationship together. So we're really professional matchmakers. They just call us salespeople. So. <laughs> that's, that's a brilliant phrase. I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, so there, there's more of this that comes through in the unexpected tour guide. There's more of this that comes through in the $97 uh, course that you can get for a bonus by buying the audio book, which, by the way, I'm going to do. So expect expect my sign up on that course. Okay. Um, but over and above that, you, you, you can always tell someone that has the potential to be a great speaker and a great keynote speaker, in my estimation, based on several things. First of all, uh, being relatable, being able to tell good stories, and being able to make points through those good stories. Right. Um, I recently was at a workshop, uh, and I won't get into a lot of details, but I was there with my wife, and at one point she leaned over, and I've known this man for 30 plus years, the, the guy who was giving the workshop and can't get enough of him. And she leaned over and she said, isn't it amazing that he and every point he makes has a story that wraps it up and delivers it poignantly? And I said, yes, it's a gift. And you not only have that, but you have this, this kind of sneaky little Southern folksiness about you. And, uh, you know, and, and it really struck me a minute ago, Jeff, when you said, and I'll bring you one of those ducks like you see on the TV. <laughs> Uh -huh. exactly. <laughs> it like works TV. for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, but see, here's the thing. It's genuine. Absolutely. That's, you know, it, it, if someone tries to uh, emulate a, a Southern folksy and they're, and they're not Southern folksy, it goes really badly. Absolutely. Um, but you've done a lot of uh, now workshops and, and leadership coaching and leadership seminars, but you do a lot of keynote speaking. Uh, share with us the just and tell me about keynote speaking and and what it is you bring and because there's a lot of people that listen to this that want to be a speaker um, right. and and so help help us understand what's involved there on a keynote i don't i don't go into workshop kind of things i don't, I don't do a deep dive into fusion points at a keynote it's more about saying i'll i'll do a little bit of a high level intro about it but then I talk about the most important fusion, the most important fusion points, and, and I'll and I and I illustrate them through stories in my life. Uh, you know, the, some of the things that I've learned that mean the most to me, and I'll I'll, I'll talk about one of those here in a second. But also in, in the lives of others, one one of the best fusion points that I have ever heard in my life. It's not from me. It's, I, I can't take credit. I was at a National Speakers Association meeting. When Herb Kelleher, uh, who used to be the uh, pre big, uh, president CEO with Southwest Airlines, he was telling the story. And he was talking about a, a family was on a Southwest Airlines flight. And they were the, it was apparently a son and daughter and an elderly mother of one of them. And she was obviously having some uh, dementia issues or Alzheimer's or whatever was going on. And when the plane landed, she refused to get off the plane. She just was not going to do it. Uh, just, just, for whatever reason was going on in her, in her mind, she wasn't getting off. And it was kind of causing an issue. And one of the flight attendants, a young man, did the most brilliant thing you could possibly do. He walked up to the lady. He said, ma'am, could I have this dance? And he put his hand out. And she looked at him and she said, why, yes. So she put her hand in his. He, she stood up, 
He put his he put his arm around her back. He held her hand and he began to sing to her as he danced her off the plane. Now, you tell me Brilliant. anywhere else that that family or anyone who saw that is going to fly with anybody but Southwest if it's available. Yeah. It's it's that positive emotional connection with the logic of what's going on. They had to get her off the plane. Yeah. Uh, my personal and I've got two of my favorite uh, fusion point stories that I'll tell in keynotes. One is um, about it's business related and it's uh, something I actually teach in the, the pre course that I give away with the tour guide book. But it's uh, I, I learned this basically from after I read endless referrals by Bob Burke. I, he, his process about connecting people together and, and networking rather than focusing on what you do, focus on connecting people. I thought, well, how can I make that work in my industry? So I called uh, uh, one of my clients, the owner of one of my accounts. It was a, a mortgage company in downtown Dallas. I think they had about 50 employees. I called the owner and said, hey, do you have some time tomorrow? I'd like to swing by and pick your brain for about 20 minutes. And he said, sure. So I went by there and we sat down. I said, well, the first thing I want to do is thank you. He said, for what? And I said, I feed my family by what I do for a living. You let me do that here. In essence, you're helping me feed my family. So I, I, I appreciate that. And so thank you for that. And he said, well, you're welcome. And I said, I kind of would like to return the favor. He said, what are you talking about? And I said, I meet people all the time. I have existing clients. I meet, I'm prospecting for new accounts. I'm meeting people all the time. I want to ask you a question. What kind of questions do I need to be asking the people I meet so that I know if they would be a good referral for me to send your way? And he said, I'm going to answer your question, but he took off his glasses. I'll never forget to lay them on his desk. And he said, I'm going to answer your question, but first I have to tell you something. And I said, what? And he said, I've been in business 30 years. You are, and I've had salespeople asking me for referrals all the time. This is literally the first time a salesperson has ever said, how can I refer business to you? Help me know how to do this for you. Mm -hmm. He said, thank you. Huge fusion points. And then we began to build, uh, we built a referral network basically out of that. And so that, that's my favorite business lesson. But what it does, when, you've, when you're focused on the value you can bring to someone else that's above and beyond the transaction you offer for your business, it's just a huge thing. It, it let, it, and it builds a relationship where I like the way Grant uh, Mueller puts it in his new book. You're not just top of mind, you're top of heart. They want you to succeed. Mm -hmm. And that's the relationship you can build. The, the best personal fusion point I learned, I actually learned... Uh, from Jack Amberson, who was my first sales manager, and I write about him in, in uh, The Unexpected Tour Guide. I grew up in a family that my parents loved me. There's no doubt. They worked hard. They put food on the table. Uh, we didn't have a lot, but we had plenty, okay? And uh, so, but that we weren't, uh, the family wasn't a verbally demonstrative group. They weren't one to tell people that they loved them and all that. I go, uh, when I was getting my master's degree out here in Texas, uh, Jack wanted me to come to work for him. And he said, come spend a week with me on your spring break and just see how I do things. See if you'd like to do the job. I said, sure. Well, I, I, I stayed at his house. I ate at his table. And for a week, we rode together and did the job. I got to know his family. And at the time, he had two kids. He had uh, uh, Ted, who I think was in the first grade about that time. Becky was a little younger. And every morning, we'd get up at like 6 o'clock in the morning. We'd be in there having coffee. His kids would come in there, Bill, and they would jump up in his lap. And he said two things to them that changed the course of my world. He said, I love you so much. And I, he gave him a kiss, and I'd never seen that. And then he said, I am so glad that God picked me to be your daddy. Hmm. Bill, I'd never seen that. It, I, I, and I didn't grow up with that kind of affirmation. And uh, it, it changed my world. And, and so when, as my daughters were born, that's how I raised my daughters. And so it changed their lives. But I've seen it now change my grandchildren's lives too. I've seen both of my daughters with their children said, I am so glad that I've got to be your mommy, that God picked me. I love you so much. And I've even had my grandchildren coach me. So I'm so, I'm so glad you're my Greg Gray. That's my nickname. <laughs> <laughs> but it's changed that. And, I've, and now as the book has gained popularity, I watched somebody from Australia recently post something. She had, she had sent me a nice message about the book. And, and right after that, she posted something to her parents that was very similar to that. 
And I sent it to Jack because he and I still keep in touch. He's dealing with some health issues right now, but he and I still keep in touch. And I said, I said, uh, you have no idea how many lives you change just by the life you live. And so, but that fusion point with me and that fusion point that's going on, it's, it's just been huge. And so it's, it's those kind of things that if we're intentional, intentional about creating them for ourselves and uh, for the people that we do business with, if we're intentional, we're focused on them, uh, not to the exclusion of being, of getting the reciprocal. We all get the reciprocal where it's okay to receive just like it's uh, you give. Mm -hmm. But when you're focused on them, oh my goodness, does it make a difference in that relationship? Yeah. Well, that, that's just uh, incredibly well stated. And again, with wonderful stories to support it. Um, you know, and, and you talked about the lives you touch by how you live. That can be good or bad. Absolutely. That can be good or bad. And we have a lot of, uh, we can choose a lot about our behavior. And I've learned more about that as I've as I've grown and matured. And I teach a lot about that uh, in in my work with people about understanding behavior and understanding that we have the golden opportunity of choice. So I'm going to say this. Uh, thank you again for your time of sharing so much of your wisdom and experience and insights. I'm going to give a tease to all of the listeners because I happen to know for a fact that. Jeff is in the midst of writing two new books that he will push. They are not how-to books. One is a business parable. One is a novel. And I can't wait to read them. And it's fun that I have kind of an inside track uh, to just kind of watch this like like a little you know bird on, on, on uh, the wire looking at the traffic go by. Um, so I'm excited for that. But you've kind of just already given this answer. But, you know, the... The reason I do this show is to help people to discover, to clarify, to evolve, and to live their purpose. And my purpose principle is you need to have a purpose, which will grow and change and evolve, because that ignites your passion, which can be fleeting. So the third element is persistence. persistence. And that's one of the reasons I was so keen on hearing your uh, knowledge on the the science of persistence. So and and. I want people to ask themselves with what they're doing, because I, I didn't do this when I was in the corporate world. Uh, I didn't ask myself, OK, you're doing this, but what's the point? And that's what uh, this, this show is all about, is to help right. people ask themselves that question. So with that lengthy lead up, let me ask you that. In the context of your life and everything we've talked about today and everything you've done, share with, with the listeners uh, from Jeff C. West, what's the point? The point in my opinion, with everything that, that, that I do, with the, the things I do, it's about equipping people. It's about connecting people in such a way that they get it and they want to move forward in their own life. You know, the, the way of the fusion point works for us internally that keeps us persisting after our own goals is when we find something that means so much to us and we keep it in front of our face all the time that it constantly won't let us stop. Uh, there was at one point when I was living in the mobile home, literally with the floor falling out of it. And I had just <laughs> been so, uh, I, I allowed myself to feel very beaten up by the circumstances that I had been dealing with. It was one, I'll never forget. It was one day something ha happened that uh, it changed my life. It, what happened was, my children had to go through something because I wasn't making enough money. And that's really what it amounted to. And I said, I will never let my children go through anything like that again, ever. Uh, and it was, it, it, to an adult, it's not a big deal, but to kids it is. We had moved out of the house and their bicycles had been given away to goodwill by the people that were, that, that were there at the time. And I couldn't afford to go buy them another bicycle. And they were nine and five at the time. So that wasn't a, a discussion they were willing to have without it being pretty emotional mm -hmm. for them. And I remember going out on the front porch of that mobile home and I stood there and I was out there 45 minutes and it was a little bit rainy and I wouldn't go back inside because they had stopped crying, but I hadn't. But that mm -hmm. emotional thing that happened right there was where I drew a line in the sand. I said, no more. 
And from that point forward, it didn't matter when I made a sales call if someone said yes or if they said no. I had pictures of my daughters in my daytimer back then, uh, but I had pictures of my daughters. And before every call, I reminded myself, the, this is why I'm going in this store. I'm going to do a good job, but this is why I can never, ever give up. And I found that bond, and that's my most positive fusion point because it's when I really found my, you hear people about finding your why. That was the day that for me it changed. And that, so you can, you can stack the deck in your favor if you keep your most positive emotional connections in front of you as you pursue any worthy goal, and it's going to help you stay after it. It's going to help you persist. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So everybody go to jeffcwest.com. It is so rich with content and free information and uh, leading you to things that are going to help you go wherever you buy your books and get the unexpected tour guide. Absolutely get said the lady with the blue hair. Go listen to Lisa Wilbur's episode. And uh, there's there's just so much here, Jeff. I'm, I'm thrilled to have had you as a guest. I appreciate your insight and your time. Thank you, my friend. It's my pleasure. I'm honored to, that you had me on. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for tuning in. And if you like what you heard, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We can promise you'll gain value in every one. Rating and reviewing makes us more discoverable and helps others find out what's the point. And if you'd like to know more about Bill Ellis or contact him, please visit his website, www.brandingpillars.com. See you next time.